Thank you. And uh, yeah, it's great to be, it's very equally a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I've been wanting to come for ages, so this is, uh, this is great to finally be here. Um, so what I've given you is a rather long handout. It's sort of something halfway between a handout and a, and a short paper, uh, I suppose. And I'm just going to pick and choose various bits from it and thread them together uh, in a way. It's a very long paper, about 100 pages, and I've tried to pick out the bits that fit together to get across the points I want to get across today. So there's a distinction people allude to often between natural and non-natural meaning. And they say that here's this distinction due to Grice and let's see what we can do with it. And can we actually make some progress in the philosophy of language by isolating what people call natural meaning and then focusing on non-natural meaning, uh, which is supposed to include things like speaker meaning and linguistic meaning. Well, th that type of distinction is a very old one. It's, it's, it's one of a tradition of distinctions along these lines. I suppose the most famous one of these sorts is the, the, uh, the, the Augustine one between natural and conventional signs and the Persis distinction between indexical signs and iconic and also symbolic signs on the other. So a lot of these trichotomies don't map exactly onto Grice's dichotomy, uh, but the, the, the tradition and the driving forces between these distinctions uh, are pretty much the same. Now, there's a distinction that gets made as well between in, um, in, in natural signs, between those that are signals, usually animal signaling is the classic example of this, and those natural signs that aren't signals, like clouds, black clouds are not supposed to be a signal of rain in quite the same way that what a particular vervet monkey, the noise it emits, is supposed to be a signal of something. Now, why do we make this distinction? Well, we feel there's something different about clouds and monkeys that monkeys have, you know, there's some sort of organic input of a type that clouds don't actually have to the, to the behavior. Even though, as, a nat as naturalists, we want to, in some sense, deny that there's uh, ultimately uh, a huge difference. Um, now, Grice's idea was to explain non-natural meaning, speaker meaning and linguistic meaning in particular, in terms of natural meaning. And um, with the rise of naturalistic theories of meaning, um, you know, causal theories, indicator theories, teleosemantic theories, evolutionary game theory, and so on. There's been a sort of move to think it looks sort of odd and old-fashioned in some way to think there is this notion of non-natural meaning that's distinct from natural meaning. And so I suppose Brian Skirms, more than anyone, is the person who has more recently uh, pushed the line that there's no sharp distinction of note of quite the type that Grice um, has in mind. So on the bottom of page two there, he says, this is a footnote to the, the opening paragraph of his, of his book. Um, so in a famous essay on meaning, Grice distinguishes natural and non-natural meaning, and then he gives a list of people he thinks are uh, the tradition that all meaning is natural meaning. And then he says in a footnote, Grice is pointing to a real distinction, but it's actually a distinction between conventional and non-conventional meaning. Conventional meaning is a variety of natural meaning. Natural dynamic processes, evolution and learning create conventions. I mean, the first point is just as an understanding of Grice, that cannot be right because Grice thinks there's all sorts of non-natural meaning that doesn't involve conventions. In fact, Grice tries to understand conventional meaning in terms of speaker meaning, and speaker meaning is a variety of non-natural meaning which doesn't have to involve conventions. So that can't be quite right. Um, but I want to, in a way, bridge the gap between the naturalists and the non-naturalists here. I don't want to get into what... Um, Max Black has uh, called uh, Geisteswissenschaften versus natural science split, or between Geist philosophy and non-Geist philosophy, as Skirms um, sees it, sort of you know, Cartesianism and so on. So I don't want to get into that sort of split. I want to take naturalism very seriously, but I don't think we have to go quite the route um, that people have wanted to go. So there are two theses which are just driving this, I, the paper right now. Um, but there is an important distinction to be made between natural and non-natural meaning. It's a real philosophically significant distinction. However, I think that there are two ends of a, of a pole, and that, in fact, is Grice's view. Um, the second, which is many people think must be incompatible with the first view, is that in all sentences of this form, S means P, um, the verb mean has the same semantics. P 
People often read Grice as saying, oh, well, there's natural meaning and non-natural meaning. The verb mean is ambiguous between a natural sense and a non-natural sense, so Grice is positing an ambiguity. People like Horwich and many others have, have made this claim. That's not actually right. Grice is arguing against mean being ambiguous, and you have to read the rest, you know, the, the whole paper meaning and his other papers, later papers on this, to understand exactly how this is all to fit together. He no more thinks that the word mean is ambiguous than he thinks the word and is ambiguous, or the word or, for that matter, uh, or the word reason, uh, one that he cared a lot about. Um, so we need to get clear about the semantics of S means the P. So in a sense, all I'm doing is giving you the semantics of the word mean. Right? What does mean mean? Uh, a, a, a little theory about how we should understand the semantics of that word. And the claim is, it's got a univocal semantics, insofar as we're interested in natural, non-natural meaning. We don't have to posit any sort of ambiguity, which I take to be Grice's own view. So the first thing I want to do is look at what I'm calling the logical grammar of mean. As on the face of it, means it looks like just an ordinary transitive verb. Right? X means P, or S means P, something like this. So it's a two-place, um, expresses a binary relation, just like um, a verb like cause, or represent, or know. Now, we know you can do other stuff on the right-hand side of some of these verbs, too, but knowing seems to be a relation, express a two-place relation, the verb know, and so does uh, mean, and so does represent and cause. These verbs seem to be standard um, transitive verbs. Um, now, on the face of it, as well, the S and the P on the left and the right-hand side of words of a word like means, S and P, they seem to be nominals. They seem to be noun phrases of some sort that are used to pick something out. And the sentence as a whole seems to be true if the relation expressed by the verb holds between the two things that the two nominals stand for, regular, uh, regular um, extensional semantics on the face of it. Um, but we know uh, in English uh, we can have so-called that clauses. It's probably not a great phrase for them, they're really that nominals. We have means that so-and-so. We have knows that so-and-so, where so-and-so is a sentence. Um, many of our attitude verbs are of that sort. I mean, arguably, all the ones that are genuinely attitude verbs are of that sort. That believe, doubt, hope, know, and so on. Um, so I'm going to call every sentence of the form S means P a meaning specification, and all of those uh, where S stands for a linguistic object, a meaning attribution. So if you say, it's raining means that so-and-so, that would be a, a meaning attribution. Uh, whereas all the other, in general, all those um, sentences are meaning specifications. All right. Um, now, whatever a theory of meaning is going to do for a language, it ought to, at least one would think, say what these things are, these meanings uh, that words have. So th there's, a, of course, a very, there's always been a very live debate about whether we need to posit meanings as entities or whether we can have a theory of meaning which doesn't posit uh, entities. I'm going to just take the line here, which is, I think, <laughs> driving a lot of non-Davidson-inspired semantics, that there are these things, meanings, that sentences and words actually have, and that part of what a theory of meaning is supposed to do is to explain the relationship between words and these things. But what's the relation in question? Well, the relation is usually called the, the meaning relation. So there's a sort of ambiguity in the use of the word meaning when we talk about saying, talking about the, the property and talking about the object. Uh, or the relation and, and, and the object that, that has it. Um, we, so we talk about people meaning things, right? He meant that such and such. We talk about words meaning things. We talk about states of affairs meaning things, those clouds. The presence of those clouds mean it's going to rain. So lots of types of nominals that we can use as the subject S in uh, S means um, that P. Um, so let's just look at the main uses of, me, of I mean. The, the, Initial distinction between natural and non-natural meaning can be made very simply with examples one and two on page four. Um, and the thing to notice is that the, the right-hand side of the verb mean is the same on both of these. So using a capital N to, it, to just indicate that we're talking about, seems to be a sentence that's a specification of natural meaning, and NN 
uh, with Grice to indicate that we're, seems that we're talking about a specification of non-natural meaning without claiming that the verb is actually ambiguous. This is just a little device, and I'm going to claim that there's no ambiguity, but it'll help us to, um, as we go, to keep these separate. So, the presence of those spots on her face meant that Anne had measles. Um, by uttering or saying, she has measles, Sam meant that Anne had measles. So, any theory that's going to claim that meaning expresses a two-place relation is going to have to say what the thing on the right-hand side of means actually stands for, what sort of entity it actually stands for. And it looks, on the face of it, as if it's the same thing in those two sentences, because on the right-hand side of means, you've got something of the form that P, that Anne had measles. On both. So it looks as if something is being said to stand in a relationship of meaning to whatever that Anne has measles uh, refers to in both of those sentences, which might seem a little odd because it might seem a little pun-like if you say, oh, there's something that Sam and those spots both mean, right? that Anne has measles. Well, Sam and the presence of those spots on Anne's face mean uh, that Anne has measles. They both mean that Anne has measles. Some people find that something of a pun. Other people are much happier with it. Um, the people who find it a pun are very quick to say that the verb mean must have two different meanings. It's a pun involving the word mean. But, of course, it could equally be a pun involving the P. <laughs> right? There's nothing you know, on the surface of this, it's going to tell you that it's actually mean that's, that's ambiguous. It could be that that P stands for one type of entity in a, a statement about natural meaning and a different type of entity in a statement about non-natural meaning. Um, and in fact, uh, I think ultimately what Grice's own view boils down to the view that on the right-hand side of means, you're sometimes, talk you're sometimes indicating a state of affairs and sometimes you're talking about a specification of a state of affairs. And that's really the difference as, as he actually sees it. I think we can go even further than that. So Grice has this distinction between, and this is the unification he likes, it's not the one I'm going to go for, that any phrase of the form that P, I'll explain why I'm using italics and where I'm using bold in just a minute, but it, 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 the basic idea is that bold face indicates it's a nominal, and P, ita italics indicates it's a sentence. And I want to keep those separate for reasons that will become clear. Um, so Grice wants to say, in, in, you can have a worldly entity or a conceptual entity. right? So those are the two types of things that get picked out by phrases of that P. And so in a, roughly, the statement of natural meaning, your that P picks out a state of affairs or a fact or something like that. Whereas in a, when you've got a, a statement about non-natural meaning, you're, you're, pick, you're, you're getting at a proposition which might be a conception of a state of affairs, let's say. It might be isomorphic, in fact with a state of affairs. Um, look, there are lots of other uses of the verb mean where you don't seem to um, be using a, a that clause, and, uh, but arguably many of them have hidden expressions in them. Um, so getting older means getting slower. It means something like pro getting older means pro getting slower. Something like, anyway, I won't worry about those types of cases. Um, what I want to do is jump to these four assumptions over on the next page, page six. Um, they're all revisable. I don't think they really need revising, but they're all easily revisable if we need to. And they are supposed to give us everything we need to start with to get the, the sort of logical grammar clear. Um, so firstly, that the, the specifications of interest are those of the form S means P, where boldface S and P are just placeholders for the um, subject and complement, uh, respectively, of means. Um, that S and P in S means P, boldface are nominals, as I just said, and that uh, means expresses a two-place relation. So those three assumptions have been in play uh, since, since I started. Um, so a consequence of this, that, uh, that any instantiation of this sentence form S means P has the same structure as a sentence like 11, not a sentence like 12. So in 11, you've got, again, a singular term, uh, as the subject and the direct object of causes, represents, or loves. Whereas in 12, these connectives, you have sentences on the right and left-hand side. Now, people often say that means takes a sentence as its complement and things like this, or as its subject, even, people have said. This cannot be right. What you've got is some complex nominal that itself contains um, a sentence. So the structure is uh, the structure that you see in 11, not the structure you see in 12. 
So I'm going to call, in a statement S means P, I'll call S the bearer nominal. It's the, the thing that bears meaning. Okay? And I'll just call P the meaning nominal. Okay? That's just the name of the type of phrase, the bearer nominal and the meaning nominal. And you can even call the thing that the, the bearer nominal designates the bearer of the meaning and the thing that the, the meaning nominal designates the meaning. Okay? Just to keep things easy. Now here's a fourth assumption uh, which Grice makes, which uh, I'm not going to make. It's, it's not a condition on the viability of a univocal semantics for a verb phi expressing a two-place relation in a sentence expressing S phi P that there's a single metaphysical category uh, to which everything that can serve as a possible reference of an expression instantiating P belongs. I mean, think about this. We don't impose this restriction when it comes to book. You know, I like that book. Could mean it's the physical object you like. Could mean the plot that you like. Right? It could be that edition. Right? They belong to different metaphysical categories in a certain sense, you know, narrowly construed. Okay? So we shouldn't impose that constraint. Um, uh, we don't impose it on in interpreting the direct object of likes. So why should we uh, impose it on the direct object of any, uh, any other verb? Right, so let's have some conventions which will make life very easy. The first one is that, uh, we, so again, I'm using uh, italics now to indicate sentences. If P is a declarative sentence, let P bold, I'll say it loudly, P be a canonical nominal that can replace the occurrence of the meaning nominal that P, in S means that P, with the occurrence of P in the resultant sentence S means P, referring to whatever the occurrence of that P refers to in the original sentence. So bold P refers to whatever that P with P italics refers to. Okay? So we can use those, we can interchange them, that P with P italics with bold P. Um, because, you know, if we mean that means rain, then, then P will just be a, a straightforward singular term. But if something means that it will rain, that's different. Uh, that's, you've got a sentence em embedded in a so-called that clause. So now we've, Grice makes lots of sort of use mention pr trouble for himself uh, by not distinguishing between sentences and singular terms and quoted terms and so on. So, so we, we can purge Grice's prose of, of, of all the problems and state his view about the single notion of meaning quite easily now. Uh, so it's in the middle of page seven here. Grice's single overarching idea, the root idea in the notion of meaning, which in one form or another would apply to both not natural and non-natural meaning, he says, is that if S means that P, then this is equivalent to, or at least contains as a part of what it means, the claim that P is a consequence of S. So let's forget about the idea it contains part of. Let's just suppose it's really, the, we take the equivalence seriously, which he does later. So the simple idea then, S means P is equivalent to very least entails P is a consequence of S on some suitable notion of consequence. Now, the first time I saw this, I thought, this has got to be wrong. There's an obvious problem. We don't want to say that Anne's having measles is a consequence of the spots on her face. Surely the presence of the spots is a consequence of her having measles. So it seems completely backwards for the gr first case that Grice gives us, right? We don't think of we don't think of, this, of, the, of the measles being a consequence of the spots. The, spot, the spots being a consequence of the measles. So something must have gone wrong, or we've interpreted Grice in, in far too uh, a, a um, wooden way. And I think that's what, uh, what we've done. Um, and I think we can fix all this uh, in, in a certain way. I'll come to in a minute. Um, so let's make, let's make the fifth assumption now. And this is a more controversial assumption, but it's one that Grice actually made. It's A5. In a meaning specification, S means P, the meaning nominal stands for a state of affairs. It always stands for a state of affairs. And sometimes he talks about um, a fact. And then the uh, sixth assumption is the counterpart of that one for non-natural meaning, and I alluded to it already, and it's that the meaning nominal stands for a representation of a state of affairs, or a conception of a state of affairs, or something like this. It's a, some sort of abstract characterization, something that maps onto a state of affairs. So that's, so that's A6. So that way you've got some sort of connection between that P in statements of natural meaning and that P in statements of non-natural meaning. They don't stand for exactly the same thing, but one is a representation of the other. And that seems to be the idea that Grice um, has in mind. And I, I think we can, we can actually eliminate uh, 
any sort of uh, division between the two. Um, the seventh assumption uh, accords with a, a, an observation Grice makes right at the beginning of meaning, that when you've got a, a statement um, of uh, natural meaning, you can replace it with something like the fact that. So you can say the fact that Anne has those spots on her, me on her face means that she has measles. Right? Just, the presence of those spots. The fact that she has those spots. So we can now say something about um, the subject of the verb mean, that it could be a nominal, but it could also be a nominal of the form the fact that P, fact that S, not just S. So it looks as if we can have that complex nominal as the subject. Um, and that's given in convention two there. So with the, all this convention in place now, we, all of the following four senses are going to be equivalent. This is at uh, sort of three quarters of the way down page eight. These are all going to be equivalent now. S means P, the fact that S means P, S means that P, and the fact that S means that P. Those will all be equivalent. As long as we're careful to use bold where we need to use bold for nominals and italics for where we're talking about sentences, it's all going to be fine. Um, so, uh, Let's make this provisional assumption with Grice that the bearer nominal as well, not just the meaning nominal, stands for a state of affairs, right? the, the subject of word means. So this gives us a very old position, actually, that basically meaning is a relation between states of affairs. And of course, anyone who's ever been anywhere near CSLI will be aware of that idea. So this idea that somehow meaning is just a relation between state of affairs. If you just follow through the, lo the logic of the grammar of this, you seem to end up with a little bit of pushing towards the end once you've you know, adopted the idea of states of affairs or facts or whatever. You see natural meaning as um, this relation between these things and it all accords with the way the grammar, at least of English, seems to work, if this all holds together. All right. Um, Let's jump straight over now to page 10 and this al alleged distinction, I'll, I'll say it, this alleged distinction between natural and non-natural meaning. The natural meaning is factive and non-natural meaning is non-factive. Okay. Um, there's something to this, but I don't think it's quite what people make out. So here's this uh, standard definition of a factive verb. A verb phi is semantically factive if all instances of F are true. If X phi is that P, then P. So no is a factor. If you know that P, then P. If you remember that P, then P. If you've proved that P, then P, and so on. Um, and then the non-factive verbs, minus F, verbs like believe. If you believe that P, it doesn't follow that P. Okay? If you say that P, if your conversation implicate that P, conjecture, pray that P, hope that P, all non-factive. Okay? So that's supposed to be a really standard distinction in the semantics and philosophy literature more generally. Um, what about the verb mean? What do we say? And here's the sort of argument which people usually use to talk about uh, an ambiguity. They'll say that when mean is used to express natural meaning, it's factive. When it's used to express non-natural meaning, it's non-factive. Um, so if you go back to the, um, the, the presence of those spots on Anne's face means that she's got measles. If that's true, then she's got measles. If the presence of those spots on her face means that she's got measles, then she's got measles. Whereas if Sam says she has measles, that doesn't mean that she's got measles. Sam could be misinformed or lying. Okay? And nature doesn't do that. At least non-animate nature doesn't do that sort of thing. Okay? Um, and that's supposed to be an important... And that's immediately it should give away that there's going to be some middle ground, again, between clouds and people, or between clouds and monkeys. There's going to be all sorts of places where the factivity, non-factivity distinction seems a bit murky. And it should, for reasons that will become clear. Um, right, so um, let, we can use this word factive. Uh, we can talk about the verb being factive. We can talk about a sentence exhibiting factivity and about natural meaning itself being factive, simply knowing and remembering being factive. So that's, that's I think, in line with standard uh, discussions. Now what about transitivity? Well that's interesting. If, if it's factive, natural meaning is factive, then it's going to be transitive too. If S means P and P means Q, then S means Q if it's factive. And that enables us to make sense of something people have thought you couldn't make sense of, um, Dretzky's Xerox principle. Uh, because that just translates now into if S carries the information that P and P carries the information that Q, then S carries the information that Q. So that Xerox principle of Dretzky's is supposed to be the analogue of the transitivity of natural meaning. I think they're probably both 
wrong ultimately. But anyway, at least we can render the Dretzky idea intelligible now. Another difference between mean when it's used to talk about natural meaning uh, versus non-natural meaning concerns um, opacity. Um, the complement of mean is referentially transparent, um, bottom of 10 going on to 11 now. Um, if the presence of those spots on her face meant that Anne had measles, and if Anne is Mary, then the presence of those spots on her face meant that Mary had measles. Just follows. Okay? But the complement of mean when you're talking about non-natural mean doesn't seem to be uh, in the same way it doesn't for believe. And, uh, and, and it's obviously not nothing to do with factivity because if you know that uh, FA and A is B, it doesn't follow you know that FB. So factivity and, um, and uh, being substitute and don't go necessarily together. So it looks as if we've got two um, obstacles to uh, a univocal semantics for mean. That on its natural understanding, it's factive, and non-natural meaning, it's non-factive. On its natural meaning, it's, it allows the it's referentially transparent, it's pl allows the substitution of singular terms, uh, whereas when it's used non-naturally, it doesn't. Okay. Now, oh, I meant there's supposed to be some lines connecting these. Um, this is a, actually a, a tree diagram of notions of meaning. Um, I can just go through a bit of it. Which, so look, so you, we, you divide meaning, you say there's natural meaning and non-natural meaning, start with, it seems intuitive enough. And then with non-natural meaning, what does Grice do? He says, well, I'm taking the notion of what a speaker means to be the basic notion, and I'm going to use that to throw light on, ultimately, conventional meaning. And then conventional meaning itself divides into linguistic meaning and non-linguistic. Um, direct and indirect, so speaker meaning divides into direct and indirect what Grice calls what is said and what's implicated. That's just direct speaker meaning and indirect speaker meaning. But the one I'm going to focus on right now is the difference uh, within linguistic meaning you, between what Grice calls timeless meaning and occasion meaning. Some people call timeless meaning um, Dennis Stamp, came, uh, standing meaning. Dennis Stamp introduced this idea. He didn't like the idea of timeless uh, because of its connotation that it could, there couldn't be meaning change or something like that. Um, but I'm going to just use Grice's label, and I'm going to use those as, as, as generic labels for a type of distinction which can be formally implemented in many ways, the most famous of which is Kaplan's distinction between character and content. So Grice doesn't have a technical distinction here, it's just there's, a, there's, a, there's what the word means in the abstract and what it means relative to an occasion because of that's the way we are when we use words in order to say what we want to say. So. Um, Strawson really put this idea in, 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 in the sort of unpublished works, of, well, some of it's come out now. Uh, he talks about how Strawson, uh, through the dis discussion of descriptions, put it into his head the idea that we need to distinguish between the meaning and the reference of an expression, and that it should be a fully general distinction, not the one that Strawson went with and not the one that Kaplan focused on. I mean, uh, you know, folk, Kaplan doesn't really talk about characters of, of non singular terms. But uh, Grice said, look, this is a general distinction we need to make between the abstract thing that you just know about the meaning of an expression, independently of any particular occasion of use, and the force that it actually has, uh, it, it, it's, if you like, its compositional contribution on a particular occasion of use. So I, I'll sometimes talk about character and content, but that's to be understood as a specific type of formal implementation, which Grice and Strawson had nothing remotely um, like that. Okay, now an important point uh, which gets lost sometimes in the literature for Kaplan and, and for Grice too, character, uh, that is um, timeless meaning for Grice, is a property of expressions themselves, right? But so is content. Now a lot of people say content is something that a token of an expression has. And Kaplan is very careful, he never says that, right? Content is something the expression itself has relative to something, which he calls a, a context. But it's the expression, not the utterance of it. I mean, that would mess up Kaplan's logic completely if it was something like the utterance or the token that had this thing, the content. It's the, it's the expression itself. So I'm going to forget it. The whole type, con type token distinction seems to me is a huge mess. The distinction we need, and the one that Grice uses, and the one that Kaplan needs, is the distinction between the words themselves and then these events that take place that involve these utterances of events, these actions that we perform with them. That's the distinction we need. And we need events and we need words. What we don't need is this orthogonal distinction, which is actually a bit of a mess. Um, Grice calls it facile and uh, Kaplan sort of rails on it in his uh, discussion of words between 
types and tokens, it doesn't actually solve any problem. I mean, especially the way people try to talk about types and tokens and similarity relations and so on. I mean, it's, it's a big mess, as Kaplan pointed out. So I'm going to just avoid that way of talking and just talk about the words and then these concrete events, these utterances, the words. Okay, so the one, one way of thinking about this distinction now between natural and non-natural meanings is to say that the, the, the word itself has one meaning, but it has two different occasion meanings. And the same with the word, if I use the word I, if Adam uses the word I, they have the same um, standing meaning, same timeless meaning, same character, but then on a particular, relative to a particular context, they have a different other type of meaning, right? Which you want occasion meaning, at least content. In one case, it's me, and in the other case, it's Adam. Um, and that's, uh, why not, why can't verbs have such properties? Because we've got this sort of, I don't know if it's prejudice, but indexicals are where you can see it so obviously, at least with the word I. It's a bit more complicated with all the others, we know, but, but there is this distinction between knowing the meaning of today and, and knowing what, what day it is, right? Um, so with all of these indexicals, we have this distinction, and maybe it's an across-the-board distinction. Okay. Now, Reconati seems to hold something like this view too. I think Carsten and Sperber and Wilson maybe too. I think there's a sort of been a, a sort of broad move in this general direction that we need to distinguish between the abstract notion of what a particular word means and what the word means relative to a particular use. So we can call it character and content if we like. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to say that here's one way of thinking about the distinction, uh, Grice's distinction. All right. So let's look now in the middle. Uh, between factive and non-factive meaning. And I think the animal signals case uh, is a good one here uh, because it, it makes it very clear that the distinction shouldn't be a sharp <coughs> one and can't be a sharp one. People often bring up animal signals as a problem for Grice uh, because they say, well, you know, they seem to be, uh, be non-factive but it's non -no not non-natural meaning. Um, I don't think that's much of an objection See, non-natural meaning is supposed to be, the way Grice character is supposed to be intentional. Right? He, de he defines speaker meaning in terms of complex intentions, and then linguistic meaning, conventional meaning, more generally, is to de be defined in terms of speaker meaning. But Grice actually preempted this type of complaint, expected this sort of complaint, and sees it as, as actually bearing out his position, if you read it carefully. So here's what he says in, in this wonderful paper, Meaning Revisited, uh, which he gave... Uh, um, in originally, I think, in 1976, but it was published in 82. Um, the meanings of natural signals, he says, are special cases of natural meaning. The non-voluntary production of such signals mean, or normally mean, that the producing creature is in this or that state. Right? So the idea is supposed to be that a creature performs certain types of behaviour, and that behaviour means something in much the same way as our linguistic behaviour does, but not quite and in much the same way as, say, leaves turning different colours or clouds appearing black mean. But it's something in between, which is very intuitively what you'd expect if you think of nature as uh, this sort of continuum with, with you know, elements at one end and human actions at the other end, right? Um, if you're a naturalist and you believe that this is all explicable in some way and you're not some die-hard dualist, you would sort of expect things to turn out this way when we start looking about things meaning other things, right? Um, so there's this continuum, and the place of animal signals uh, is somewhere between natural and non-natural meaning, and it corresponds, I don't like this terminology which Grice used much later, flexibly factive. I mean, I get the idea, I think the label is, is a terrible one. He says, factive in a special way which is divorced from full predictability where the general or normal or standard truth of P is required for the truth of S naturally, meaning that P. The truth of P is not guaranteed, but may be presumed in the absence of known interference factors. Right? It's sort of, you, it, does, it is factive unless things go wrong. That is, it is factive unless it's not, is really what this boils down to. So it's a, it, you know, we see what he's getting at, but it's not very, not very good the way he's worded it. It can be done better, and I think here we can appeal to work in naturalistic semantics to, to talk about function to actually clarify what's going on here. But we get the idea. So, you know, a monkey makes a certain type of squawk, but occasionally it gets it wrong. So there's been some interference factor. It saw a plane overhead instead of a, an eagle, and so it did a particular squawk. Does that mean that the, the, the squawk, you know, they, they're non-factive? 
Well, they usually are, but it's supposed to be not a property of individual cases, but of the phenomenon more generally. So you can see what the, 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 the problem's actually like. But once we introduce the teleosemantic idea of natural functions, it at least becomes easy to say what this is. It might not clear everything up, but at least it, it gets everything on the same sort of turf so we can see how things stand against one another. So these um, teleosemanticists like Millikan and Papineau talk about natural functions. Uh, somebody like Denkel talks of quasi-natural meaning. Uh, we can talk about quasi-factivity, functional factivity. Maybe that's a better way of getting at what Grice is talking about. Um, all right, so let's go over the page now to this very famous case of these vervet monkeys which have been studied in great detail by Seaforth, Cheney and others. So the three, let's, let's think about these um, three um, alarm types, call them E, S and L. And uh, one is when you see eagles, one's when you see snakes, and one's when you see leopards. And then there's a type of behavior that these vervets, they make this squawk, if they see eagles, they, they, they sort of go down, right? If they see uh, snakes, they go up the tree, okay? If they see leopards, they go up, uh, or they swivel around and get away. So there's a type of behavior which, this, we, as we would put it, we, we watch these monkeys and we say, ah, that means an eagle's coming. They, they produce squawk E, and then they all start coming down from the trees, from the high branches, and we say, ah, that squawk means eagle coming. That's how we describe it to ourselves, okay, which is fine. And then they, they make the, the S squawk, and we say, oh, that's, that means snakes. And this is a very natural way for us to describe it. Okay. Now, question. Uh, are we talking about um, natural meaning or non-natural meaning? And the right attitude at this point is to say, well, it's sort of complicated. Because it's a bit like natural language, but it has this non-intentional character, at least for some types of creatures. With monkeys, it's a little tricky. But we feel that one of the differences between us and clouds, for example, is that we have intentions to produce thoughts in other people, and that we can produce this type of behavior voluntarily. We have choice. The clouds don't have choice. When it comes to, as we move up the, the, the scale with, 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 with animate objects, it becomes the idea of volition and voluntary behavior becomes more graspable. But again, it's actually very complicated. I mean, you say, do dogs, do dogs actually have choices, do make choices? The monkeys actually have voluntary reactions to things or not. It's very, nobody really knows what to say about this, except it, it, it's a big mess. It doesn't seem to be like us, and it doesn't seem to be like ants or clouds. Okay, so we watch a particular vervet monkey. As every time he does this squawk, there are eagles, and we say, well, that's great. This is really like natural meaning, and that's the way a lot of ethologists have, have thought about this. Uh, it really is natural meaning. It's, it's, um, it's happening... It doesn't involve intentions, is the way a lot of people want to think about this. But then we notice he gets one wrong. We say, ah, but it's not factive. And the response ought to be something like, yeah, but it, it, usually it works. It, it has a certain function. If we can give us some sort of definition of what it is to have a function, and of course Millikan does, um, we've at least got a story there of why there's going to be something which is in between factive and wholly non-factive. So I think we, what the, the right thing to do is to see factivity and non-factivity on a sort of sliding scale. They're just poles, in the same way that natural and non-natural meaning are poles, in the same way that white and black are poles with lots of grey in between. This is what you'd expect, given the diversity of life forms that we, we encounter. Um, now, let's go to an example um, on page 14 now. When we discuss people, we make these distinctions. We, we imagine a group of bird watchers out one day, unsuccessfully looking for eagles, and on the march home, Winnie has one last look through her field glasses, thinks she spots an eagle, and yells out, eagles. And the others, prompted by her utterance, turn their eyes skyward, perhaps glancing quickly at Winnie first to get a directional fix, and raise, raise their field glasses. Alas, no eagle, she was fooled by a distant aircraft. What are we to say about the following sentences when used to describe what just happened? By producing something of type X, Winnie, this is opposed to Vinnie the vervet who got things wrong. I skipped over Vinnie. Vinnie is the, the vervet who, got, who got, made the mistake. Winnie meant that there was an eagle nearby. Winnie's or Vinnie's production of X meant there was an eagle nearby. Right, what's the difference? I mean, you want to use the word mean when you're talking about Vinnie and about Winnie. Okay, Vinnie the vervet and, and Winnie the, the bird watcher. Um, and yet, um, there seems to still be some 
discrepancy in our understanding of the relationship between what's happened, what Vinnie's done, and what Winnie's done. Right? We have no trouble saying that Winnie, she meant, she speaker meant us, not non naturally meant, eagle nearby. What do we say about Vinnie? That there was just this reaction to eagle, to eagle that happens when eagles go by? Well, that's no good because it wasn't an eagle that went by. It was something that Vinnie seems to, in our language, we would say, Vinnie seems to have mistaken an eagle, uh, 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 an aircraft for an eagle. That's how we describe it. Because they don't have, he doesn't even have the capacity to register it to himself in that particular way. Um, look, so there's no evidence that vervets have the sort of higher order intentions that uh, Grice thinks that we must have in order to non naturally mean things. Um, so even if we're happy to say that Vinnie produced. Um, the bark, intending to produce the relevant flight response in neighboring vervets, he didn't have the higher order Grison intention that's supposed to be characteristic of non-natural meaning. Okay, so let's start, and this is the easy part now, we just go from a simple semantics for the word mean and make it slightly more complicated and see if we can get to something like non-natural meaning in a unified way that enables us to think of mean as having a single meaning. So the root idea, remember, S means that P, if and only if P is a consequence of S. So consequence, what is consequence? Is it a constitutive relation, a causal relation, statistical relation, evidential relation? Where in metaphysics or epistemology, presuming those are the two possible places, does it, does it fall? Well, the most popular view about this, and it's, um, it's a view that knows it touches on and then ends up, I think, with the right view later. But certainly Davis and Lamarck uh, come up with this view, is its causal explanation. I mean, Davis talks about causal covariation. So this, this view, uh, this drives a very bad, uh, I think, overall theory about what interpretation amounts to, which is the earlier part of this paper that I'm not talking about here. Um, the, so the idea is supposed to be we interpret C, the, the, the simple root idea, in terms of CC, this, this expansion of it. S means that P, if and if P is a causal consequence of S. Well, the first um, point, just look at 30 and 31. The fact that the barometer needle has swung sharply to the left means there's been a sudden drop in pressure. Versus the fact that there's been a sudden drop in pressure means there'll soon be a storm. Those could both be true. But only 31 conforms to CC, 30 doesn't. It seems to conform to the other way around, which is like the, the measles case again. It seems to conform to CC prime. S means that P, if and only if S is a causal consequence of P, not P a causal consequence of S. So we've seen somewhere the cause goes one way, somewhere it goes the other way, but means doesn't seem to be a symmetric verb. Okay, so this can't be quite right. It can't be that you can just mean it one or the other. It can't just mean cause, and it can't mean is caused by. Unless it's ambiguous between causes and is caused by. It seems highly unlikely. But notice transitivity is actually preserved. If um, 30 and 31 are both true, so is 32. The fact that barometer needle has swung sharp to the left means there will soon be a storm. So that's odd that 30 and 31 both seem to be, can both be true, but they can't both be true on the same causal story. One's going one way, one's going the other, but we do get transitivity. That's a sort of odd thing. How about causal necessity? So here we go in terms of necessity operators. Um, well, you could say S means that P, if, it's, if and only if it's causally necessary, that if S, P, and I'll come to conditionals in just a minute. Um, so uh, we could actually lose, we lose factivity here, but we could shove it back in, but, but, but just by fear, just put factivity in for now and see what actually happens to keep it in the realm of straightforward natural meaning. So um, we could do it um, directly if we said S means P if and only if S and P and it's ca causally necessary if S, P. Or we could do it less directly by just saying S means P if and only if S and it is causally necessary that if S, P. So this is the basic structure. It looks as if a statements about meaning are something very modus ponensy about them, right? You say S means that P, it means something like if S then P, S therefore P. You're getting factivity in that sort of way. Okay, there's that feel of modus ponens about it. It's like, uh, it's, like an ante it's like a conditional, S means P, but with the antecedent as well. Right, so S means P, so I'm like, sorry, if S, P, and oh, by the way, S, therefore P, giving us factivity. That's the feel of this sort of thing. I don't think it's quite right in the end, but it, it captures something of what's going on. 
Um, the problem is, um, one problem is compositionality, which we can restore with a, a better theory of conditionals. Maybe I won't go into much detail about this today. Um, but the first thing to notice is that causal necessity is just too narrow for this. Take um, that a fig tree is growing here means there's a source of water here. Or that Sam and Anna here means that Sam is here. That's not causal, but if Sam and Anna are here, that means that Sam is here. But that's not causal exactly, and nor is the fig tree one. The fact that the fig tree is growing here means there's a source of water here. But there's some sort of physical connection, some sort of necessity involved. It's just not causal necessity. All right, so maybe it's broader notion, physical necessity, turnover. Could be, we can just broaden it. So S means that P, if and only if S, and it's physically necessary that if S, P. It's still too narrow. Um, that nine is odd means its successor is even. That's true, but it's not physical necessity. That I think means I exist. So we can just do all our favorite old philosophical slogans we can put in this format. That I think means that I exist, right? The cogito. Um, that's something, I mean, if there's such a thing, that looks like it's metaphysical necessity, right? Uh, 35 looks like it's mathematical necessity. So 36, metaphysical. That Sam's an assassin means that he's evil. Deontic necessity. That Sam has been caught speeding again means he's facing a hefty fine. Legal necessity. That interest rates have risen means that fewer mortgages will be approved. Economic necessity, right? There's some sort of connection. It doesn't have to be causal. It doesn't have to be physical. It doesn't have to be anything in particular, right? So the idea is uh, an idea which I think you find uh, in some discussions of modality these days is that modal expressions are sort of empty of the type of a type of force. They say there's some necessary connection between something. And it's then you know, up to your theory to specify the nature of the connection. I mean, you know, if you look at modal logic, there's nothing about S4 itself which guarantees a specific notion of necessity, or about S5 itself. That's a philosophical question, which modal system is best, best captures a particular type of necessity. And it may not be any of them. There may be in-between systems that we have to tinker. Um, so, but we don't have to make these decisions in advance of looking at the formalism of a modal system. Right? We, can, we explore the modal system and see which ones come out best in accord with the di different notion of necessity we're interested in. So the idea here is, ah, oh, we've got to the bottom of what's going on with the verb mean. It's a modal. It's, a, it's like a conditional. Right? And we know there's an obvious connection between conditionals and modals. So we've got something like skeletal, skeletal necessity, let's call it. So this gives us M on there. So whereas um, 33 gave us was physical necessity, we, then we had a logical necessity with Sam and Anna here. Therefore, Sam's here, Metaphys metaphysical, mathematical, ethical, and so on. Uh, we say there's just this very general notion of necessity that's captured by, um, by a, um, the word mean, and the occasion meaning specifies it out. So the, the, the um, timeless meaning is just that necessary connection. Right? The occasion meaning specifies what type of necessary connection, whether it's, you know. And of course, with modal verbs, we do that, this happens all the time. You don't have to specify the nature of necessity when you use words like can and must or would. And we all spot these bad arguments where can has been used in, with one modality in one sentence and must or should has been used uh, in a, with a different modality in a different one. It's not a problem with the modals itself. It's problems with our use of modals on specific occasions and not keeping track of the particular modalities that we're interested in. So the idea would be that mean is just like this. And now, Grice thinks this, this is, he thinks this is in Kant, this view, right, about the modals, right? That there's no, there's no ambiguity in a modal, right? It's just the nature of the necessity in question is, is, is a matter of what the topic of conversation is. I mean, you just looked at those sentences and you knew by what the subject matter was in those sentences, what sort of necessity must be involved in saying that S means P. Because, because of what they were about. And, and of course, Grice actually talks about things like interest rates as naturally meaning things. You know, he talks about the, the recent budget means that we shall have a hard year. So once we've pulled away from it having to be causal or physical, we can talk about natural meaning in a much broader sense that includes sort of logical, mathematical, economic uh, types of necessity. We're, we're, in a sense, we're stretching the notion of natural meaning as far as it can go to include more and more no modal notions that we actually need in just making sense of ordinary talk involving the word mean. 
So this is how things should go, one would think. Now the limiting case is just going to be mean as applied to when we mean things, and then derivatively, if you're a Gricean, what it means for the objects that we use to mean things, words themselves. So all of those sentences uh, just given can be given this modal sort of analysis. Um, so for example, um, nines being odd means that its successor is even, 35, would just come out as 35 prime. <laughs> nine's odd, box if nine is odd, its successor is even. Okay. Now, it's not the theory I'm going to end up with. I think this is very, very instructive. It sends us in the right direction, but it's left the ball in the metaphysics court, and I think ultimately it's got to go into the epistemology court. Um, so this does comport with my position on modals. That's fine. But I think that what we're going to find is when we use the word mean, it's in an epistemic sense that appeals to uh, various modal facts. So if you turn over, let's go straight to, I won't actually go through the conditionals themselves because it's, it's not necessary to go to evidence and necessity. Right, on page 20. So the thought that natural meaning is a causal notion led us via causal consequence, um, reversal of grammatical flow, and so on to uh, a general theory uh, of, a, a, of a modal nature, which can be handled in terms of conditionals. And I said, I think this is a mistake. Well, I said, it's not the theory I shall end up with. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not the theory I shall end up with. So it's a mistake if it's assumed to be the final theory of the word, the semantics of the word mean. Uh, here's what I think is the right view, which is very often rejected for, because of all the sorts of examples that I've just given. Most of the people who talked about causal uh, understanding of mean um, say this. Th there's a reason for all this, I should say. Um, people want to say, people have argued that interpretation is this, there is this process called interpretation that we interpret things. And it, for anything you can mention, you can talk about interpreting it. So, but the only way to, uh, people have found to actually make this sort of robust is to say, well, what, what do you do when you interpret? You discover the meaning of something. Now, we, we understand what that is I mean, in, in utterance interpretation, for example. But when you say interpreting art, in, you, yeah, you've interpreted it when you found the meaning. You've interpreted the data when you found, well, what is the meaning of what the data means and so on. So we, this, people have wanted to say we can have a very general theory of interpretation. I think this is very misguided. And it's an attempt to somehow put the word mean to all sorts of bizarre uses that it cannot possibly have in the type of discussions of the philosophy of language that we are interested in. There's no doubt that all sorts of things have symbolic significance for people. That's, that's not a problem. But what people have done to, to make this um, sharp is to say, ah, we just need Grice's distinction between natural and non-natural meaning. Right? Cultural interpretation is the discovery of, of non-natural meaning. Scientific interpretation is the discovery of natural meaning. Okay? Now you can see how that has a certain type of appeal. The problem is, not all cultural meaning is, has the sort of richness of Gricean intentions. Doesn't seem to have, anyway. But worse than that, not all of the stuff that we want to say is scientific meaning can be cashed out in natural meaning as understood in the causal sense. Right? There's just too much stuff there that doesn't seem to fit into either category. And then there's stuff in between. So I think the idea of a monolithic interpretation being somehow saved by a Gricean distinction between natural and non-natural meaning is a, a real non-starter. But that's a, it's a long story. I won't go into it um, here. So here's the, what I think is the right way to think about this, though, um, is E. S means that P, if and only if S is evidence for P. Now, that's a really simple analysis. And people get very upset when they see this. And they say, so it's just an evidential relationship. That's all the word mean uh, expresses. Um, so what about all these analyses you just went through? You're throwing all those out of the window now and saying the whole thing's epistemic? Well, not quite. I think this really got us somewhere. Um, so there's two fallacies that I think crop up a lot in philosophy. I've talked about one of them elsewhere, the scene reading fallacy. This occurs when a non-existent reading of a sentence is captured or predicted as a result of mistakenly baking into the semantics of an expression a fact about a scenario truly described by that sentence. But there's a, a, a fallacy, and, and that happens, you get this with descriptions and, and, and many other uh, expressions in natural language. But the, the fallacy I want to focus on is this sort of the rationality equivalent of that. I call it a rationale reading fallacy. And this is the important one. This occurs when a non-existing reading of a sentence, sigma, 
is captured or predicted as a result of mistakenly baking into the semantics of the expression sigma some fact about the speaker's rationale for using sigma. Right? Let's not confuse the meaning of an expression with some feature of the rationale the speaker actually has for using that expression on a given occasion. Right? The rationale may go well, I mean, the rationale will always go beyond the meaning of an expression, but sometimes there are certain features of the rationale that, that people, I think, are mistakenly baking into the meanings of words. And I think the word mean is a classic example of this. Um, so what I'm going to claim is the evidential analysis just given captures all the data we just looked at once we make this distinction between the rationale and the semantics. Um, the, the kind and strength of evidence is going to vary with subject matter, but neither the kind nor the strength of the evidence contributes to the truth conditions of S means P. Right? Neither the kind nor the truth condition, nor the strength contributes. Okay. Um, now, in many cases, and we, we looked at some already, strength and kind can be inferred almost immediately. Um, in other cases, we have to think. So, uh, go back to those examples, that list, it's actually 33 to 39, but anyway, list 34 to 39. A speaker will believe that he's uttering a truth if he believes that S and accepts that something, something leads us from S to P. That's a rationale for asserting any of those particular sentences. The form, though, two's being even means that its successor is odd. Uh, my thinking means that I exist. So if you believe that there's some root, um, that will be part of your rationale. But that doesn't mean that that root is part of the meaning of the expression itself. You may give away your root by using that expression because of the nature of the subject matter, but that shouldn't be baked into the meaning of the word. Um, so, now look at the barometer example. This is, uh, in, in a way, this gets me slightly too much. Now the transitivity, that, that was a very strange example where one had to be interpreted causally one way, the other had to be interpreted causally the other way, if causal necessity was the right thing to say. And yet we got transitivity. On the evidential view, all works out right. Because just look at 30 to 32 here. The fact that the barometer needle has swung sharply to the left means that there's been a sudden drop in pressure. Right? It's evidence that there's drop in pressure. True. The fact that there's been a sudden drop in pressure means there will soon be a storm, right? Drop in pressure is evidence there will be a storm. 32, the fact that the barometer needle has swung sharply to the left means there will soon be a storm is evidence true. So the, the, so the, the transitivity um, appears to uh, go through here. So in cases where you really have got factivity, you will get transitivity without having to um, appeal to any particular um, notion of um, any, any particular modal notion. This just follows from evidence. If you think <laughs> that evidential notions are transitive, there's a big problem. Not all evidential notions. I mean, it's not the case that if A, if a is evidence for B and B is evidence for C, that A is evidence for C. So that needs to be dealt with at a certain point. Um, so um, I'm, the claim then is this, this evidential analysis captures all the relevant data and that these rationale reading fallacies of uh, led us to entertain all sorts of weird and wonderful causal necessity notions uh, of meaning, which we don't need to actually do. So what happens then when we get to non-natural meaning? Well, this now comports with the sort of story I think that Sperber and Wilson and others are actually telling, that what's actually happening when you speak, you're presenting evidence for something being the case. It's just the limiting case. This is the case where there's choice involved, right? We make these noises, we say, Anne has measles, that is, other things being equal, evidence that Anne has measles, right? What do you mean by other things being equal? Well, if I'm completely honest and informed, you're going to have, fact, you're going to have factivity, right? If I can't be mistaken, and I and I'm always tell the truth, I never say things that are false, then you, obviously you're going to have factivity, transitivity, and so on. But we know that's not the case. We know that we're not perfect with the, either the information we have or the information we're willing to, uh, to impart. Right? So you, you, you would expect a, fall away, a more dramatic fall off from factivity once you get to the types of behavior that humans perform in order to get across information, utterances in particular. Right? So this way you have, a, you have an evidential notion of meaning all the way across. Just at one end you're going to expect the evidence to be of the form of human behavior produced by choice, um, by imperfect creatures, whereas that, the, the relevant notion of choice and the relevant notion of imperfection don't exist outside the human mind. 
Now, maybe there's a case for some of the higher primates, deception and types of cases. That a lot of it depends on how we actually characterize the notion of deception. But clouds don't deceive, right? Probably ants don't deceive and snails don't deceive. Some creatures go funny colors for various reasons to camouflage and so on. And that might be, you know, there might be there's very good functional explanations for why, for why that's the case. Okay. Um, now, how does that fit into the, the evidential? Well, it's, it's evidence of, of a particular internal state, exactly as Grice said when he discussed what a natural signal actually is. So, um, if, if this strategy is right, consequence is the right relation, right? For, for, in S means that P, it is a consequence relation, but it's an, evident, it's an evidential notion. That's the right way to think about it. Um, so, go down to, well, um, Yeah, just go down to the bottom of page 22. So let's think about the explanation of the strangeness of three and four. Um, so the, remember the first four sentences we had. The first one was a straightforward case of natural meaning. The presence of those spots on her face meant that Anne had measles. Over. Uh, and then the, natural, non, the, the, the first non-natural case was, was speaker meaning. By saying she has measles, Sam meant that, that Anne had measles. And then we've got uh, the seeming joke. Sam and the presence of those spots on Anne's face both meant that Anne had measles. You could also have the sentence. Okay. The sentence, Anne has measles, right? Uh, John's utterance and those spots all meant that Anne had measles. I don't know how bad people find that. Um, well, one explanation would be, if, if you do find it bad, is the, uh, the occurrences of mean are being used, with, uh, uh, being used with different meanings. I don't buy that. There doesn't seem to be any good reason for that. Uh, the, the, the whole noun phrase, that P, is being used with two different meanings. There doesn't seem to be any reason to do that. The evidential theorist seems to have um, an answer here. So the default is as if uttering the default situation is when you produce an utterance, it's evidence for something. Okay? And that's what, it's, that's what the, over time it's evolved that way. But it doesn't always work, okay? Uh, for the reasons, the, the two obvious reasons um, we mentioned, the, the possibility of deception and the possibility of um, Error. Um, the story about getting linguistic meaning is a, a, a little tougher. I'll just say that these statements seem to be, many of these seem to be um, ill-formed, it seems to me. When people say that um, snow is white means that snow is white, it's not clear that's even well-formed. A lot of these seem to be best understood as quotational, but I'm, I'm not going to, there's no time to go into that sort of story here. So the conclusion I want to draw is the correct semantics is actually simple. S means that P is true if and, if, if and only if S is evidence that P. Meaning is evidence. So means, means, means. Um, the kind and the strength of evidence will vary with subject matter, but neither the kind nor the strength contributes to the truth conditions of S means P. Um, the semantics assumes neither lexical ambiguity nor the erasure of a, of a theoretically dis robust distinction between natural and natural meaning. And we shouldn't get hung up, and this is, a, I think, the sort of one of the bigger morals, and whether our philosophical distinctions are exhaustive and exclusive. And we do often get hung up, and we shouldn't. Um, most distinctions aren't exhaustive or exclusive unless they're stipulated as such in a certain way well in advance. And, uh, and the, the debate about natural and non-natural meaning is like this. And Grice never did stipulate that it's a sharp, sharp division. Um, there's also a moral that comes out is that the exploration of biconditionals is actually, I mean, Schiffer and Fodor and many people said that just exploring biconditionals in this sort of way that we see in, in discussions of knowledge and discussion of meaning is, is actually a dead end philosophy. It seems to me it's a very, very fruitful tool for ruling out the ways we don't want to go. So I would disagree completely with Schiffer and Fodor on that particular issue. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Adam. I think this might amount to a terminological question mm -hmm. in the end, but so to understand affectivity, usually it's thought to be like a property of the verb or a property of the well, that's what, itself. Right? Yeah, so that's why I said it, I gave it three different yeah. ways of talking about it, yeah. But I was thinking, like, you might think the affectivity here is nothing to do with the verb. verb at all. Yeah, absolutely. It's more like yep. your knowledge of the things that are taken yep. over a lot of. And then yep. there's no explanation you have to offer. It's never factored. It's Good. just, I know clouds don't lie, so now yep. I infer that. 
Right. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that we've, we've invented this term factor for certain verbs, and there's a certain sort of logical semantic property they're supposed to have. Yeah. But very often what we're really focusing on is the statement itself, and it's the relationship between the two things. So we can actually dispense with this talk of factivity and yeah, factivity not, in the end. Yeah. And not model a no-river proof. So it's really decent right. written into the logical yeah. semantics. Yeah. Yeah, we don't really, I, I mean, I don't think we want to write into semantics of any verb, actually. I mean, there's, there is a difference between knowledge and belief. I'll, look, I'll, I'll, I'll agree. But look, there may be just a, a handful of verbs for which you feel. I mean, we do feel a strong pull, right? With remember, I think, and no. Okay, but you know, you run experiments in this with people, and you don't always get factivity in the results. I don't know what that shows. Uh, the thing that they tend to pick on is you get these projections. Yeah. He didn't know them, yeah. There's yeah. no way, like, S means that P is going to project, or S doesn't mean that P is going to project over P, right? True. So, but what it knows, at least it, it, default, it, 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 it does, 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 it does, does, does so seem to, yeah. There's a difference yeah. Although if you say S doesn't know that P, um, that doesn't entail P, does it? No, it presupposes. It, it's sort of, you know, you're sort of conversationally implicating or presupposing that, uh, that I mean, P. Fact, yeah, with that. Yeah. But, you know, there's something yeah. about knowing what the word no means. That sure. It tells you that. Yeah. By default, assume P. In a way By default, yes, yes. That, I mean, I'm very happy to put it like that. By default, assume that P. Okay. But without building it as an entailment, though. No. Yes, right. I, I think that's good. That's yeah, 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 I'm happy with that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was just wondering, um, well, I don't know if it makes much sense, but I was wondering whether, uh, what to do with the non-assertive utterances, whether it should be as well included in this Should be, should be. So does this mean that P? Things like that. Yeah, because I, I, yeah. it seems that in the, in the case of um, interrogation or, or yeah. things like that, this um, evidence picture is not as I don't see how it would oh, so, so, oh, I thought you were going to say it does. Okay. So it seems to me it's right. You say, is, uh, does that mean that P? Is that evidence that this is going to happen now? I mean, it seems a very natural way to, you know, uh, the police are here. Does that mean we have to shut the party down? The police are here. Is that evidence that the party needs to be shut down? Well, I, I was thinking of cases of uh, kind of uh, performative utterances. Okay. Like that. So, so if you say, for instance, um, uh, by uh, uttering, could you pass me the salt? Um, she meant, uh, or well, I don't know whether mm, mean or yeah. mean should be used in this kind of. I see, sorry, I sorry, you're imagining a case of non-natural meaning where the utterance is a, a, a non-declarative sentence. Yeah. Right, I see. Sorry, okay, I misunderstood the question. So yeah, so it is evidence that she wants the salt passed to her, isn't it? Well, yeah, I guess. Seems to be. I mean, I when somebody says to me, can you pass the salt, I take that as evidence that they want me to pass the salt. Because yeah. that's what they mean. Yeah. yeah? I think it does work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about when somebody at, uh, interprets a metaphor and it says, mm, that's means that... Blah, blah, blah. I don't take questions on metaphor. So, a metaphor, <laughs> then... That metaphor means that... whatever. Yeah. So, it's not the, an evidence. The perfect, uh, you the know, I don't... A metaphor is one of those cases where I, I really don't like the use of the word mean. So like, like all sorts of symbolism and stuff, where there's the sort of cases I was talking about with interpretation. We'd certainly interpret metaphor. I, no problem saying we interpret metaphor. I don't think that we cert what we do is find the meaning of the metaphor. I don't think the metaphor itself has a meaning as such, right? Metaphorical uses of words are something that we actually do. Speakers actually make um, metaphorical uses of expressions, and in so doing they manage to communicate things that are divorced in interesting ways from what they can convey with literal uses of those words. But I don't think there's anything to say that the metaphor itself has a meaning. So I'm very much with people like Davidson and Grice on this, that the metaphor itself doesn't have a meaning. 
Though we do interpret metaphors, or rather, we interpret metaphorical uses of words, or wo metaphorical uses of expressions more generally. So in this case, uh, what she meant by that metaphor in, this, in that... Oh, what she meant. Ah, what she meant is fine. I'm a bit about what the what the speaker actually meant, right? So the that yeah. So the speaker using that expression is evidence for something. That's for a certain type of thought they want you to entertain, which may not be even propositional, of course, in the metaphor case. It might be more um, sort of involving imagery or so on. So I want to say that you can mean something, a person can mean something using metaphorical language. I hazard that it's not always propositional. So I'm, you know, quite a few people hold this view that it's, it's I mean, there's, there was a, attempts for years to make all metaphorical statements come out as means that such and such, right? And it doesn't mean very good. Um, in the same way that conversational implicature, I suspect, is not actually always propositional. I mean, if you take, the very famous uh, letter of recommendation case of Grice's, right? You say, you write, Jones has wonderful handwriting, he's always on time. W what is the content of the implicature, the proposition? Is it the proposition that Jones is no good, that Jones shouldn't be hired, that I wouldn't hire Jones if I were you? Those aren't the same proposition. They're all in the same sort of, you know, but they're, they're, it's surely the only thing that's going on there is, is, is this is saying Jones, you know, negative, Jones, something like this, like Jones, ugh. You know, it's, it's much more like Jones, right, than it is anything propositional, right? You get this sense of something dismissive about the attitude towards Jones that can't necessarily be put into a single sentence that characterizes the precise content of it. And I suspect many implicatures are actually like that. And Grice says as much, right at the end, the last paragraph of Logic and Conversation, he says that they're very indeterminate. And I think it goes beyond that. They're more imagistic a lot of the time than propositional. And I think metaphor is just... Even, even worse on that score, or w worse, M even more extreme on that score. It's funny because he defines it as what the speaker must have in mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, just to clarify, um, your general analysis is for SB's non subscript P, right? Yeah, without any subscript, yeah. Okay. So it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, Oh yeah, so is, it, is the subscript still on there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh sorry. The, the, yeah, right at the end, the subscript's supposed to go at the end. Yeah. <laughs> so you're supposed to get. Well, right. let's have a look. Where is it? Uh, so it, it needs to be said twice, I suppose. Once with the subscript, and then again without the subscript. Yeah. Oh, at the bottom of page twenty, there it is with the subscript, and then the final story will be E prime. You just take off the subscript, and you've got the, the, the generalization. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> All right. uh, so. So. S means P is equivalent to a S is evidence for P. Yeah. Uh, that would be like the uh, timeless meaning of S means P. And then an occasion, particular occasions, that will be specified more or maybe would enter into the truth conditions, like is this specific sort of right. evidence okay. for P or uh, right. Like no, so, this, the, so here I'm actually undecided. There's two possible ways to go here. So. One way would be, to, and it's the way I'm, I think I'm rejecting, is to say that you've got the, you've got the timeless, single timeless meaning uh, for, for me, the word mean. And then on the occasion meaning, uh, occasion meaning one, occasion meaning two, uh, this is this would be natural meaning and non-natural meaning. So I'm not going down that road. I originally thought about this road because that seems to be Grice's view. He doesn't actually put it like that, but in the, the, the much later work, that seems to be the view he's ending up with. So he wants to make the sharp distinction between timeless meaning and occasion meaning, and he does seem to want to say that the natural meaning, non-natural meaning, is on a na by analogy. So he takes this, you know, the idea from Aristotle very seriously uh, that you. So what, what does Austin say about pleasure? Pleasures are various, right? But that doesn't mean that the word pleasure is ambiguous or that there's some similarity that all pleasures have either, that there, there isn't. But there's a sort of, there, are, there, are, there are relations between things which enable you to talk about um, various types of analogy. So on Grice's view, you see non-natural meaning as, a sort of on an, as an analogy. With this. I don't like that idea, so that's not the road I want to go. I want to go closer to the, the, the way that you said. There is this single timeless meaning, 
there. Of, and then on a particular occasion, um, it can be the case that the truth, the, our perceptions of the truth conditions are actually coloured by the type of evidence. Okay? But I don't think it has to be there. I think it's something that you, you can infer what sort of evidence people uh, have for their statement okay, without having to say that it's part of the truth conditions. But I'm willing to allow that there may be cases where uh, the type of evidence is so crucial to what's being discussed that you can allow it to now become part of the occasion meaning. So I can say there can be an so there can be a timeless so there's a timeless meaning. There can be an occasion meaning, which is pretty much identical to the timeless meaning, right? But the, for the, yeah, but there could be an occasion meaning where the nature of the discussion, the nature of the type of evidence, say in court, for example, mm -hmm. right, when you, in, in legal proceedings, where there's something in the nature of the proceedings which requires you to talk about the the sorts of um, the rationale behind something meaning something else. But I don't think it's a requirement of English. It may be a requirement of particular types of discourses where certain types of evidence are being taken into account. Now, I think there's some problems with that view, but that's, that, that's, the, that's the idea. Yeah, I mean, all, all these examples are true on the same basis, right? Uh, well, some there are cases of evidence of SPP, yeah, yeah. Of course, a lot of it's going to depend on if there are these entailment relations between different modalities, or if, if that's even the right way to talk about this, right? Whether all mathematical truths are metaphysically necessary, and, and so on, whether all physical truths. I think it's physically necessary, it's metaphysically necessary, and, and so all these issues about this are going to crop up, I suppose, yeah. Eros. Just a very basic understanding question. Uh, I like very much the notion of cashing out the meaning of meaning in terms of evidence, etc. And the way you can, you can characterize this kind of middle ground, the clouds among the end of the universe, etc. And the thinking about the velvet monkey, yeah. where or you can display the ego or when the monkey can misrepresent an eagle as a, a drone as an eagle. And yeah. So well, the timeless meaning of one particular cry, if it got a meaning. The timeless meaning of what, sorry? Of the particular sound. Yeah. Well, it's, it's that sound. Does it, does it have some meaning? It's, if it's if there's systematicity involved, you say you, you, you yes in the front, yes good okay. But you cannot, you cannot say that. Yeah, but it's it's a bit like the cases that, that uh, Kepler was talking about, uh, where you know the sort of thing that it's evidence for, right? You know that uh, you know here's what the it's hard because you've got to put yourself in the head of a vervet monkey. But let's we yeah. we try and do, it's, it's it's a nightmare trying to do this right. But it's as if they've got this noise, and they make this particular noise when they mean, as we want to put it, uh, eagle approaching, okay? Um, I mean, that's the best that we can do to describe it. Because look, ethologists, when they report on this, they don't just say, and Vinny the vervet's uh, squawk meant there was an eagle. They summarize all the data at the end, and they say a squawk of this particular type, and then they describe it. That squawk means eagles coming, right? In the same way that if you report on French speakers, you know, and you, you say, um, uh, and when they use the word cochon, they use it to talk about pigs. So you, we do divorce it from any particular uh, occasion. And, and the ethologists wouldn't be doing it if they didn't do that. They try to classify these different signs. So the, whatever you, however you want to classify those, whatever your criteria are for classifying those sounds in that way, let's call that the meanings of those signs, the timeless meanings of those signs. I mean, you do want the timeless occasion mean distinction for the vervet too. Because you want to be able to talk about squawk of that, you know, that type of squawk, and then particular squawks. Would we have a double type problem? I, I don't know. But we could look for, for the first of all, these squawks are indexical. They don't mean they can. Ne they never actually mean you know eagles in twenty minutes. No. They mean eagles. Yeah, they're they're all indexical, all of them. Indexical. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or next Tuesday, watch out. You know, could be some eagles. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, I think that I was thinking uh, about your talking in terms of about in terms of situations and attitudes. Yeah. So the the distinction between what well, the distinction you were talking about the natural meaning, conventional meaning. So the idea of talking of there are relations that that they call constraints and this kind of relations. Yeah. But they distinguish in, in terms of they call it natural uh, constraints to to the ones that are not sustained by organism. Yeah, discourse constraints. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. but and and the conventional ones are sustained by organism. Yeah. So in that sense, the com the the monkeys yeah. since they are living things and they sustain certain relation between situations. Those are conventional, so that there would be right. no natural meaning, meaning mm. in that sense. And maybe the, dis the distinction between us and them, uh, and uh, us and them, <laughs> yes, sorry, might be that we don't just, by our, our biological, whatever, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, that we create relations between situations, but we, we can create relations between situations on purpose. Yeah, right. No, that, that will that Good. Will be. Good. And another, and another point, and I don't know if it makes sense, uh, that, uh, so when you say that this means this, uh, it might be because when you uh, play with this framework, the, an event can have information, but it can go forwards or backwards. backwards yeah. So maybe is that I see and with uh, mm -hmm. the skin badly. So what I am saying is that that thing conveys to me the information that she has missiles, not that that cause missiles. Sure. So what is happening there is that, that there is a kind of backwards, like, mm -hmm. oh, this is telling me that. It, yeah. It has right. Gone. Yeah. This yeah. Sickness. Okay. Maybe that the direction of from where you take the information. Right. Good. Play a role there. Absolutely. So yeah. So look. Um, so there's lots going on here. So first of all, on the evidence front, that's exactly one of the reasons why I like the evidential story because something happening now can be evidence for something that's going to happen, or it can be evidence for something that has happened, or evidence for something that is happening. So the the temporal flow doesn't matter, which is nice because the, in mean statements it looks as if you can go in either direction temporally mm -hmm. and causally. So that's what I, one of the things I like about the evidential story. Okay. Um, just because of the nature of it. some things are evidence for forward looking and some are evidence backward looking. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the creatures themselves having conventions, this is tricky. Um, so, on Grice's view, there can be non natural meaning without conventional meaning. In fact, all the cases that Schiffer and Grice and people were looking at to start with were all these one off cases where the speaker had a certain intention to induce a particular type of belief or behavior in somebody by means of the recognition of that intention, independently of any convention. That was supposed to be the idea, right? So there was, the idea was to analyze speaker meaning without any notion of conventional meaning. And in fact, to then turn things back, turn things around and then say, now we can use this notion of. Um, of um, speaker meaning to talk about convention, what people have called conventional meaning or linguistic meaning more narrowly, uh, in terms of regularities in types of behavior. Okay. Now, what you're, I think what you're suggesting for the, the, the Vervet case might in fact be true and a problem for the Gricean enterprise more generally at one level, because it's as if whatever states these creatures have got themselves into now, where they have certain types of behavior, it looks as if they didn't pass through the stage of forming these complex Gricean intentions in order to come up with these conventions, right? Now, you can, so many things you could say at this point. You could say, well, therefore they're not conventions, which seems to be cheating a bit, right? Yeah. Uh, or you could say, wait a minute, who's to, why do you think that the development of a particular species is relevant to this enterprise? Right? We're talking about things as they are right now, the possibilities for the creatures. that are. What sustains our conventions right, are the ability to continually form intentions of the right type uh, to get across certain types of messages. That's the sustaining nature of it right now. Right. You'd have to say then that with the verb, it's something else is lead to the sustaining of it, and it might be the 
involuntary nature of it, right? That could be, that could be the story. So what, what you end up with is saying that um, there is something special about uh, certain types of communication as it's the conditions that sustain them, right? So what makes something genuinely non-natural, the stuff that we call non-natural meaning, is that it's sustained by, by choices that are actually made by, by people rather than anything else. Whereas for creatures further down, it's, it's sustained purely functionally. Now, the TDS Amantis will want to say, well, that's really what's going on with us. It's just much more complicated functions. And there's something right about that. Yeah. Adam. So, I think I know what you're going to say, but I might have <laughs> So, you tackled a fair bit of obstacle one, but not two, the substitution of co-referentials. Yeah. And so it's independent activity, right? So, I was curious. I assume it's the matching of conceptual relations that's going to do the work of blocking but yeah, well, but right. Uh, oh, so uh, so which so which example are you talking about? Now, the on page ten and eleven. Yeah, on eleven. Eleven, yeah, the, the top of eleven. The activity one, and I can see how that goes. The idea for the substitution one that all non-natural meaning is going to be correct. I just want the explanation of the lack of substitutivity for the non-natural, not the natural. Okay. I assume it's oh. the conceptual matching as opposed to the state of affairs matching. That, right, that's that, right. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, and, and, and of course, that's great for Grice, yeah. because he's saying that non-natural meaning is actually this conceptual thing, whereas for natural meaning, it's a fact. And it doesn't matter, you can replace a piece of a fact with the very same thing, whatever you call it, right? And no difference. But yes, it's the conceptual nature of the... So that, that's how Grice gets around that problem, yeah. I mean, he doesn't address the. He doesn't bring up the problem, but that's clearly he's got the machinery to, to get around the. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, good. Yeah, I should have mentioned that actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I, I think that I'm not coaching all the idea, but just to clarify my mind of all this. Uh, so, you said that. Are the the word what has meaning and then you use the word in different way, right? So well, think of it on the model of the indexicals. I think it's easiest. There's a, there's a something that you know by knowing the meaning of the word I that we all know. But when I use it, I talk about myself. When you talk use it, you're talking about yourself. So the, so the content in that sort of meaning is different in the two cases. Yeah. Okay. So then the evidence of something is the use. It's not the meaning. The no? Right, that's why, and that's one of the reasons I said uh, right at the end is giving the um, timeless meanings is the hardest part of all of this, right? It's much easier to talk about the occasion meanings, right? So if you look at all the statements that Grimes gives in this case, they're all occasion meanings. All the, all the ones that really work are for occasion meanings. So if you go back to the original sentences, one through four, uh, I think it is. Right, so, the, 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 so look at example two. By uttering or saying she has measles, Sam meant that Anne uh, had measles. So it's by, it's by uttering that, that, on, that on that occasion, it's, it's a type of occasion meaning there. But then you go to look at, um, uh, where are we? Ah, this is an old version. All right, I better put it on the board, it's not here. Um, so a statement of, um, um, Here's how you might talk about linguistic meaning. Um, the surprise that's not on the handout. Hang on, I really don't want to have to write all this up. That's very strange. Ah, yes, this is an old version. Well, I don't believe in it this anymore. <laughs> um, so, uh, so here's okay, the sentence. Um, uh, she has measles. Right. The sentence she has measles means that Anne has measles, that's got to be a statement of occasion meaning, because it's the sentence she has measles uh, as, you know, as uttered, something like this, as uttered by Sam on this occasion, might be one way to, or relative to this context, if you're a Kaplanian, relative to the context of Sam's utterance, <coughs> 
whatever your favorite story is for talking about occasion meaning, um, all the ones that really we can make a lot of sense of have this form where you've got something that's sentential here uh, as part of this uh, noun phrase here and something sentential over here as well. Uh, so something, uh, a, a, a noun phrase again over here, the S one. So this means that, uh, but of course it's, because we're talking about occasion meaning, it's, it's relativized in some way to an occasion or to an utterance, whatever your favorite story, story is. Now, the sentence, and, uh, and, and of course this works for singular terms too. Um, so you'd say she, uh, she uh, blah, 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 relative to this concept means and. So there's a case with um, simple uh, singular terms on either side of means. So you say she, uh, relative to this context, means an. Right? So it's just reference. If you, if you hold this view, you take meaning of singular terms to be the same thing as reference, which I, which I do. Right? So, um, but the, the word she doesn't mean an timelessly, obviously, right? So we can't have that. So how do we, and that's why I left this with a sort of puzzle at the end, because I think we get ourselves in a big mess a lot of the time when we try to do this. Um, and I think a lot of the time, the best we can do is quotation, right? Um, so, so here's a, um, you see, if somebody says, what does um, snow is white mean? You say, snow is white means that snow is white. And so you put this nominal on the right-hand side. But if somebody says, what does beneath mean? You say, well, beneath means under. Um, there's something strange about that because you don't want to say that the verb mean can have an expression of any syntactic category on there. So if you, if you put beneath uh, means under, you've now got a preposition. I don't know any other verb that takes as its complement just a preposition, nothing else. As, I mean, there are, there are no such verbs. So it would be very strange to say that the verb mean can take a category of any, any expression you like on the right-hand side as its complement. But you can turn this into a noun phrase very easily if you put quotation marks around it. Um, and now people say, well, that's not informative. Well, it, it, it is if you know what under means, right? Um, it's very informative because it means something like beneath means what under means, right? Right, so then, so any sentence that, that you use one of these, you say whatever one is evidence for, the other is going to be evidence for. That would be the idea. Uh, what about the indexical in the quotation? Yeah, well, this is an indexical here. Yeah, yeah. The speaker of the, well, yeah, this will do in this case. She just means it's some, some female, some, you know, it, the, the timeless meaning of she uh, is simply, it's not a, it's not, it shouldn't be said as a as propositional form. It's not of the form the so-and-so, right? It's a constraint on legitimate uses uh, in order to make, to, uh, on occasion meanings. So the word I doesn't mean the speaker, right? That's not the meaning of the word I, but what the, the meaning of the character of the word I is a constraint on legitimate usage. And the constraint is that it can only be used if the person being talked about is the speaker, okay. right? And with she, the constraint is that the person you're talking about has to be female, let's say, right? So, uh, we, but, but to state them purely propositionally and put them on the right-hand side of means, I think gets everything wrong about what timeless meaning really is. That's the problem. So a lot of these statements that get made are really just quotational statements, like this one. It just means that you can, whenever you use beneath, you can use under, because they have the same meaning. So the people are right when they say this doesn't tell you what the meaning of beneath is. They say this can't be any good. It doesn't tell you what the meaning of beneath is. But, but if you know the meaning of the word under, you can work it out pretty easily. And right? Vice Sorry? And vice versa. And vice versa, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is what we do when we talk with foreign languages. We say, what does that neige mean? Language means snow. It doesn't mean snow. It means what snow means. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't mean snow. Does that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the philosopher's statements about timeless meaning are very weird, and uh, a lot of them seem to be just ill formed. I mean, you know, people have these tricks. They capitalize them, they underline them on the right hand side, they italicize, bold faced, you name it. All the tricks are out there. But it doesn't uh, solve anything. 
I mean, they, but at least quotation, I mean, there are problems with quotation, but at least we know what's, what you're trying to get at here, so, you know, but just bold facing and say, well, that's just the name of the meaning. So, it's me, so it means the, and then whatever it's, what it, the meaning names. Uh, well, anyway, you know the whole, all these objections to Horwich's theory on this score. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. I was trying to remember back to all those like counterexamples and back and forth with Price and Strauss and with the rats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So someone lets rats out in the house. Yeah. It's not supposed to mean that the house is rats, right? He doesn't mean it is, yeah, but, but it, is, it is supposed to be taken as evidence. It's good evidence. Yeah, it's, 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 it's his evidence, yeah, yeah. So, right. Are you worried about that, sir? Uh, yeah. So. Um, I mean, you can mess with the strength, but it's pretty good. I mean, it's great. Yeah. So, uh, so th does everybody know this example? So, this is supposed to be a, a counter example to Grice that I think came from Strauss, and he says, you could, you, you, your friend is buying a house, and you think the house is rat infested. You know the house is rat infested, let's say. He doesn't know this, and you want him to learn that the house is rat infested, but you don't want him to know that you're trying to get him to know this. So what do you do? You let rats loose around the house when he's watching, as long as, he doesn't know that you're watching, so you think that he's not watching you, but you think he knows you enough to know that you're letting the rats loose, and so that you will find them later is evidence that he thinks there's rats there. Uh, so he's trying to get you to think there are rats there, but, say, so Strawson and Schiffer, he doesn't mean that your house is rat infested. So one, obje one response to this is, Sure, he does, right? Which is, uh, and of course, some people have had, and it, the, the Strawson uh, Schiffer story, it's got to be wholly overt, it's got to be mutual knowledge, something like this. It's got to be wholly overt. So, this is supposed to be uh, something which requires attacking on an extra clause. And Adam's worry is this is really strong evidence, so why not say uh, we've got a case of meaning here? And I think the, the right response to this is well, we've got to talk about whether it's whether the person means uh, there are, so that, Strawson and Grice are talking about speaker meaning at that point. So it's whether the person uh, is providing evidence that there are rats, and then whether putting rats there is evidence for there being rats. And part of the problem is, of course, once you do put rats there, there are rats there, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah, right, yeah, it's yeah, it's great, yeah, yeah, it's great, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good one, yeah. Yeah. Because the presence of the rats is perfectly good, but it's, but it's natural evidence for there being rats. But the worry from the example is that you're supposed to believe that there are rats on the basis of the, you take your friend to be sincerely trying to get you to believe they're rats without him thinking that you know <laughs> that he's doing it. It's a, it, yeah. It's yeah, I know. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, I know, yeah. The, six, the, the, the 60s were weird. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. <laughs>